Hello and welcome to another episode of Pod of the Gaps uh, with myself, Aaron Edwards, Michael Otts and Andy Bannister. Um, lovely to be with you guys again and to see your smiling, well-tanned faces. Yeah, do you know, I was uh, away camping uh, last weekend. We took the kids uh, up into the mountains of Scotland. The sun was shining. And yeah, I'm amazed. Like 48 hours of sunshine, which is about a Scottish summer. And uh, I've now gone quite a spot of beach root red, which is my usual my usual look. You're also sporting a kind of spiky hair do, which is different to normal. That was the wind today. That's the East Coast of Scotland wind. That's the it? East Coast. So, yeah, you've got the great thing about, um, I figured out, I've been here five years now in Scotland, and I figured out the way to think about the Scottish weather, Aaron, is God has the Scottish weather on factory demonstration mode. You know, you'd walk yeah. into a store in the old days when they're selling computers and it would show all the things it can do as you watch it. Well, it's like that here in Scotland. We get sun, we get rain, wind, we get rain, sleet, hail, all in 24 hours. So if you want That's to know it. what the British weather is, come to Scotland. One day we'll show you it's factory <laughs> demonstration mode. That's wonderful. And, and Michael, just to pick on your hair as well, I've never really picked up on the fact that you have this wonderful silver streak. Maybe your fan base know this, and they're like, how do you not know about the, the Ots silver like streak? Like a badger. Like a badger. Yeah. I know, I know. Well, the funny thing was, I remember seeing my first grey hair there. It was probably about t- over over 10 years ago now. Um, and someone said, oh, you've got grey hair. And for about three years, I would pull them out because there was about <laughs> three of them, and I could just keep pulling them out. And now, if I pulled them out, I would basically have a big bowl patch at the front of my head. Uh, but apparently, it's because um, when you, uh, like, if you have a head injury, apparently your head can go grey where you had a head injury. And when I was two, I did basically fall about 30 feet uh, onto concrete. Uh, yeah, uh, which was on national television, actually. And uh, I met Margaret Thatcher, then Prime Minister. But anyway, apparently that could be related to it. I don't know, but uh, it's my... <laughs> yeah, that explains quite a lot, I would potentially <laughs> say. I, I, I feel I've learned a lot about why you are the way you are. Well, the funny thing about this story is that um, it was actually negligence of the airport because they failed to put a notice up that there was a glass panel missing on a walkway. So it was it was their fault. And today, if that happened, obviously, you'd sue them for, for millions. But apparently back then, um, you couldn't sue the company unless you could prove long term damage, which my mum reckons that she probably could do right now. But um, at the time, they couldn't. It would be interesting to have a lawyer representing a two year old. Um, yeah. Corporations. Yeah. Interesting. Well, um yeah. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that this is we've got some good. Well, I think we almost had some good news for our listeners. I guess the vote, there's two pieces. The first piece of good news um, is that we now have our first ever binge listener, I believe, who got in touch with Michael. So, whoever that is, uh, that you, we, we are honored that we are now the recipients of binge listening. Um, so, so is, clearly- help me out here. I'm not, I'm not a okay with all these sort of funky podcasts. It's binge listening when you like watch an episode and eat lots of like unhealthy stuff at the same time time like doing no, that's what we do on the podcast that's what michael's doing when he's making right. his bread and you know eating it or eating a pork pie that he's just made there's when they listen to how many episodes did this guy listen to well, i think they, i think they basically listen to every episode that we've currently done on the drive from the south of england to the north and back again so i think that was pretty yeah. impressive pretty he good. has my sympathy yeah, yeah. And, and, the, and, and the andy bannister puns didn't like make him want to sort of drive off the road or anything at any point <laughs> which is quite impressive, I think. Um, so, yeah, that's good. So that's the first piece of good news. More bin- yeah, we can, uh, we, we need uh, more binge listeners are welcome if they need to be, or just moderated listeners. We're happy with either. Um, so please keep sharing the show if you find it helpful and uh, passing it on to others who might find it helpful. That would be great. Mm-hmm. Um, and the second piece of good news that I, th- I thought, in fact, was that Michael has set us up on Twitter. Um, but we've just been querying our Twitter handle because he'd said, "What did you say? What was our Twitter handle you'd set us up as?" Well, I think we came up as Gaps Pod, but now we're deciding that we might want to just be Pod of the Gaps because that will be easier. So, uh, so watch this space. It's tempting to say we should have a a competition, to, but you know what? I remember the first five episodes of this podcast, we did begin to get complaints about episode five. We were still talking at great length about what the show should be called. So let's just say to listeners, by this time. The, by the next episode, we guarantee, we we promise, and if not, if we haven't done it, Michael will send you uh, a free loaf of sourdough bread. Um, we will yeah. have settled on a uh, on a Twitter handle. That's right, and then you know we can we get all of our seven followers uh, uh, up to speed straight away on on Twitter. Um, and well, speaking... if all your kids joined in and listened, I mean that's that's about a dozen people there. <laughs> that's isn't true. It? That will actually double our listenership, wouldn't it? Um, no, the. Uh, of course, the nice segue there would be into Twitter is because today's episode, we are, in fact, speaking about how to fight online 
or how to engage in online skirmishing, maybe particularly relating to things, platforms like Twitter. Um, and it's something that I think that Christians have had to think about a lot or, or deal with over the last uh, decade or decade and a half, probably, since the social media platforms have really kind of come to a, uh, to a head and really started to be almost unavoidable. We've, we've obviously on this show done various reflections on digital culture, the problems of of social media use um, on the brain and all that kind of thing. Should we delete our media accounts, social media accounts, things like that? Um, here we're going to be talking about how do, we, how do we actually engage in some of the debates that are happening to engage well, to not lose our soul in the process and, and to sort of not sort of waste time along the way and this kind of thing. We've, I'm sure I, I'm kind of new to this uh, game in a way because for me, I've been off the grid for like I've tried to deliberately be off grid in that respect for like a good decade and a half um and recently have sort of felt stirred to sort of move out onto that so I only recently joined Twitter and I've been already embroiled in a few little controversies I had a friend who clearly was observing me being being uh they call it dragged don't they when you're when when you're dragged into a sort of debate or something and then everyone piles on I got a, a message from someone saying, ah, you're, you're properly on Twitter now, I see. <laughs> so, I like, right, okay. <laughs> so none of this just kind of gentle posting along and, and occasional likes and things. It's just, you get really into it. But you guys are kind of old dogs at this. You've been, you know, battling away for years. So I thought it'd be interesting to kick off you sharing your kind of maybe yeah. horror stories or something, some in, or memorable stories, shall we say, of, of moments where you've sort of been engaging in some of these skirmishes online mm-hmm. relating to, maybe especially relating to, um oh. defending the faith or whatever yeah well the funny thing is as you as you said that intro aaron i was I, I was struck by you know we forget how long twitter's been around actually i was just literally checking uh because i was thinking well how long have we been around and i've forgotten it's 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 actually 15 years this year i don't know if you saw this story the very first tweet was just sold did you hear this no yeah, so back in back in march the first of a tweet was uh was by uh, the guy who created twitter jack jack dorsey Dorsey and uh, and that he just they just sold his first tweet two point one million some <laughs> Singapore Malaysian business person has bought this tweet so I'm not quite sure tweet? like well it, it's you know, now you get really complicated they turn it into something called a non fungible asset which I thought was like uh, you know cheese that hasn't gone off um, but it's um, sort of a way of sort of certifying digital ownership so some bloke has bought this so there we go um what, that's yeah, like my, the epitome uh, of having too much money isn't it it that is you... oh, yeah just there is no accounting with stupidity i i i guess but um wow. but if anyone wants to buy this podcast i've just stressed now you can buy the first podcast of this show and it w- won't cost you 2.1 million We'd let, we could give it to you for 200 quid because that could be <laughs> on the next one um <laughs> my worst moments on on, on, on twitter and uh, we could compete with Michael and I and you as who's been the worst because Michael and I've been on there for I mean I've been on for ages because I love technical stuff. I think my I can think of three very quickly. One is that my my worst moment on Twitter it was actually sort of a combination of the digital world and the physical world. I was I was multitasking uh, as one shouldn't, and so I was trying to brush my teeth and do a tweet and um, and use the the lavatory at the same time, and the <laughs> mobile phone ended up um, where mobile phones shouldn't. Um, so that was a little embarrassing. Had to sort of, you know, fish the phone out and block it, you know, put it in the rice and everything. It, was, it survived. But yes, I almost managed to flash an iPhone because I was trying to tweet, go to the loot and clean my teeth at the same time. So there, let that be a lesson to you, uh, listeners. And then um, my other sort of embarrassing one on uh, on Twitter was when Twitter first began. I thought I'd be really useful. I could have a number of different personas. I could have like my my genuine one, my Christian one. I could also have like a couple of anonymous like atheist ones and Muslim ones that I could use just if I wanted to perhaps, you know, be more neutral in a conversation. And that's great until you get mixed up and I managed to out myself. And uh, there was much, uh, there was much sort of uh, vitriol poured, 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 sort of poured upon me, and probably quite rightly, actually. So now I just have the one. Um, but I was trying to get a bit too clever um, kind of thing. And I've also and had that- epic arguments as well that go on until three in the morning and my wife's had to come and go, put the phone away. <laughs> so there we go. That's right. Well, I noticed you do, you had, I looked at your follow account. You've got like, you had a hundred thousand, but now you have ninety nine and a half thousand. Is that right? So you've, you've lost five hundred recently. But I lose. I, yeah, I know it's terribly depressing. Really. Well, it's funny how Twitter comes and goes, right? Because about eight or nine years ago, I put vast amounts of effort into. It. I mean, just insane amounts. And actually, it was possible then to perhaps you know, when Twitter was a little bit newer to grow a following. And I, yeah, I did actually manage to really get that quite 
high, which still astonishes me quite how I did that and, and why mm. it was worth burning quite as much midnight oil. But now I think Twitter is de- 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 declining generally. I would say I get far more engagement. I love Instagram, actually, because there's more of a buzz on mm. on, um, on Instagram. But right. yes, I, I it's, it's quite funny having that many that many followers actually you can use it to like if you know if companies treat you badly you only have to say i've got a large social media following i could talk about you and, and they, they apologize <laughs> that's true I, I have, I it is a very useful that. thing actually i've done that twice it, yeah. it did actually work yeah so clearly andy you're, you're now going to be tasked with getting us on instagram as you just you know outed yourself as an instagrammer that's oh, your yeah, job yeah, more of an instagrammer, I think. follow the gaps on instagram yeah. Michael, how about you then? Any any kind of comparable stories? How has it been for you online? Yeah, it's, it's interesting actually. Just talking about um, getting followers, I, I was on Twitter and then I came off Twitter just because I wasn't finding very helpful for a while. And then I've gone back on probably about a year ago. And what I noticed is actually that's very true. If you go back on Twitter now, building a kind of Twitter following, as it were, um, is a lot harder. People have kind of found who they follow and they seem to just kind of stick with that. So it has grown a bit, but I don't have, or, or maybe I'm just being boring. I don't know, uh, but uh, but not the number of followers I used to. But then, obviously, on Facebook, I engaged um, uh, on that. Obviously, it's a slightly different kind of medium. You can speak for longer. Um, last year, um, kind of in lockdown, um, I was posting quite a bit of stuff and kind of trying to use it pro- quite proactively, I guess, with other things not happening. I was like, let's use social media and yeah. try and engage Christianly on kind of topical issues. And sometimes that's really helpful, but there was a few posts where you kind of like, you're about to post it and you're like, I know, I know this is going to kick off. Um, and uh, and it did on, on one. And um, what's quite funny is actually, it, it can often just be like one or two people, but the one or two people just really kind of went for it. And I kind of had the time, we were in lockdown, there was nothing else to do at the time. So I kind of engaged with it quite a long time. Um, but then you end up with like literally hundreds of comments. And uh, I remember fo- my mum phoned, I think, and she said, I wish these people would stop being so nasty to you on Twitter. <laughs> um, obviously, uh, uh, my mum didn't appreciate the uh, the things that people were saying. You should, but, have asked uh, her to, you should have asked her to get involved and say, Mum, come and defend my, my honour. Yeah. <laughs> she, <could be laughs> she could be Michael's mum on Twitter. You know, well, that's a great Twitter handle. I bet that's free. Yeah, it does remind me, actually, when I was at school, my mum was a, a, a supply teacher at our primary school, and I was getting bullied once at school, and my mum kind of heard about this, and uh, it's great when your mum's also a teacher at the school, because uh, she can sort out your problems. I'll get my mum on. I'll set my mum on you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you yeah. go. Well, but I mean, you know, for, I mean, obviously for some listening, even it might be a strange thing to even, um, the way we've set it up as sort of online mm. fighting. Um, because some would say, well, that's a terrible thing. How dare you do that? You know, Christians shouldn't do that. We should be, um, you know, we could pl- placate problems. We should be very, uh, we should be peacemakers. We should kind of, you know, not cause any, any trouble at all. And obviously I think in, in many ways that that is true. Um, but there's a sense in which we are called to fight, isn't there? And it's something that was one of the reasons I've decided to, you know, I set up a blog called That Good Fight recently because I think I've noticed there's there's been a sense in which public Christian engagement has lost its teeth, or lost some of its teeth at least. There might be a few left in the back, but um, we've lost a lot of sort of ground there. And I think part of it is because we've got this sense in which, yeah, and Andy's mimicking the, the lack of teeth. Um, um, in, in, I think we need to have a video of just Andy, don't we? Just somehow to the to the, the listeners, we constantly refer to Andy's visual that he's uh, giving us. But anyway, we screenshot um, this, and make it the image of the podcast. Exactly. One day we will get to a video cast. That would be that would be great. Um, but, but basically, um, yeah, there's a sense in which we need to learn how to fight again, and obviously not to fight in the wrong ways not to fight in ways where you're causing trouble, getting into controversy for the wrong reason. But there's lots of good troublemaking that the apostles caused, isn't there? And, you know, there's things that we have to reflect on that it means to be a Christian, that though you don't seek the wrong kinds of trouble, um, there's certainly, you're not going to avoid it. And I think too often, I think I've seen cowardice in Christian leaders, especially institution leaders who need know they need to say the right things. And it sort of follows the cowardice of the age the sense in which oh what are we going to get in trouble for what shouldn't we speak about i won't talk about that here i won't even if you if you stop talking about stuff enough you'll eventually stop believing it it's kind of the mantra i've sort of settled on and so i think that's partly why i've decided to get involved in some of these debates but it's not easy is it because some sometimes you can get in, in the wrong kind of fight so what's the what's the difference yeah. what's a good fight what's a bad fight well just on the fight thing for a minute i think i think you're on to something aaron i, I remember I mean, more I remember when I, back in the late 1990s, when I began going up to Speaker's Corner 
in London, mm-hmm. which is where I learned a lot of my sort of public engagement, you know, and sort of fell in with a group of Christians there who were you know, using that, 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 that context, you know, stand on a ladder, preach, especially to Muslims, but also to atheists and other. And it can be quite a, it can be quite a bun fight at a, at yeah. speaker's corner. And, you know, the, the folks who first sort of set that ministry up, I think they took the view of going, well, either Christians vacate this public square and just let Christianity be trashed and, and there'd be mm-hmm. no salt and light, or you kind of wade in and realize that you might make some mistakes, but also you might learn some things, but also you can be salt and light. I mean, I think we see that model in the New Testament mm. too. I mean, you look at, you know, Paul in, um, in the book of Acts that, you know, rents the lecture hall of Tyrannus there in Ephesus for two years. He's out there debating, not, mm. you know, giving out coffees and, 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 and doing acts of servant evangelism, but debating, which in that context is quite a strong word yeah. uh, with, the, with the Jews and the, and the Greeks and, and stuff right there in the market uh, mm. kind of place. And, Again, that's pretty lively stuff. And today's contemporary equivalent to that, I suppose, is social media, be it Twitter yeah. or one of those other kind of contexts. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I think the other phrase that sprang to mind as you were setting it up was, you know, you remember that sort of that, that idea of sort of muscular Christianity that was around a few years mm-hmm. ago? That was something mm-hmm. that Christianity needed. It was it was okay to be bold and be confident. Yeah, you want to be respectful and, and gracious, but you yeah. can still do that and be firm. And I yeah. think as a, as a young Christian, you know, perhaps some of the Christians who are the most influential on me. I had two or three really good youth workers, I think, embodied that, who were confident in what they believed. They did. They weren't afraid. They they wouldn't back down. They weren't rude or aggressive, but they were they were confident. And I know, you know, doing sort of missions and Christian missions as a teenager and stuff, and quite confident that you had these people yeah. with you because they wouldn't take any nonsense. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? I'll just jump to you in a second, Michael. But just as you said that, Andy, obviously I, what came to mind is that you've got that confidence, confident Christianity, which Solas do, which some would say, some would see the phrase confident and almost think, oh, that must mean arrogant. And that's kind of almost how we see confidence now. We see confidence, which, which basically means with con, confide, means with faith. Yeah. And, and we're, we're doing it with gusto. We're doing it with faith. We really believe this stuff and we want you to believe it too. That's the heart of Christianity. So mm-hmm. confidence is not just a thing for extroverts who who like to speak up or like to like the sound of their own voice, like the three of us might do. Um, it's actually the, the, the it's central to what it means to be a Christian is to have confidence, to have faith in who you, what you're claiming to believe for your whole life. You're staking your life on this thing. Why wouldn't you want to shout it out from the rooftops and indeed turn the world upside down as the apostles were uh, was said of yeah. the apostles? And one, and one of the things yeah. that obviously we need to let, we need to let Michael chip in or we'll start making bread yeah. products, but um <laughs> But one of the things I valued actually about hanging around Muslims throughout my my last twenty or thirty years, because that's my you know yeah. academic specialty and and so forth, is is many of my Muslim friends they're not afraid of what they believe. They're they're pretty yeah. confident, and, and I and I find that confidence infectious mm-hmm. actually. And I and here's the other thing I've often said to people: I don't get offended when my, if, a, if a Muslim friend says, "Oh, you know, the Trinity is a load of rubbish. You need to you know abandon the Bible and and follow yeah. the Quran, Allah Akbar." I'm not going to go. Oh, I'm so upset. You've yeah. really offended me. I'm going to go. I disagree with you. It's actually um, much more fun that way, in a way, in a way to kind of have that debate rather than someone who's actually way. worried about offending you. It's funny, yeah. but it's funny that I, the, one of the tweet controversies I got involved in last week, I think, that I, you know, for me, it was probably, it's probably small fry compared to you guys, but as a new, mint, hardly any followers on Twitter type uh, person, I did have various mobs coming in and having to respond to various <laughs> um, tweets. And the thing I was actually doing, and I didn't mean to get into it to this extent, but I sort of, I came to the defense of Mark Driscoll, um, which clearly you're not allowed to do on Twitter, That's very um, brave. As, I, as I subsequently found out. But it was basically someone saying, oh, Mark Driscoll shouldn't be a pastor because of his sort of heavy handed ways. And there's a new controversy that come out. I looked into it and thought, oh, it doesn't sound too, dis- doesn't sound disqualifying yet, at least. Um, but basically, I know that people are predisposed to hate voices like him because he's a bit more outspoken. And so there's a way of we, we can decry the, the kind of leaders which will have a little bit more of an edge to them um, because they're different to the kind of current milieu of, of sort of Christian leaders or what the kind of the standard is. That's the kind of, I have a genuine concern about that. So I kind of weighed in on it a little bit. I said, what about all these other leaders in church history, you know, who had a bit of an edge to them? And then obviously I, everyone was going crazy <laughs> for me. And I was like, I, I didn't really mean to kind of defend every single thing that Mark has ever done, but I do want to make this point. And no, it's really hard to get the point across. You, you try to keep responding and responding. And, as, you know, I think you said, you know, we're, we'll get onto this sort of, you know, you have to work out when, when to stop that kind of thing. But Michael, mm. so, so we've been, we've been anticipating your arrival into this. So jump in. No, it's all right. I'll put the sourdough down and uh, no. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think there were 
two types of people out there, people who love confrontation and kind of get off on it. And, and you know, sometimes they probably should kind of get off Twitter a bit more um, because it's almost like they're, their modus operandi is just I want to I want to find someone to disagree with um but then you obviously have the opposite extreme don't you where we kind of want to avoid all confrontation and we're really worried that someone might ever disagree with us about anything and so we don't say anything of any significance and so I think you know we need to kind of recognize who we are kind of intrinsically and and be aware of our kind of you know of our you know the temptation to do one or the other yeah. I, I think sometimes it, i kind of have a love-hate relationship i have to say with um uh, getting involved in kind of facebook and twitter debates there are times when i will and you know last year as i said you know um more recently haven't done that quite so much um and sometimes i think kind of this is a big waste of time there's other things i could be doing but at the same time i guess it's it's a little bit like when I used to do kind of lunch bar talks at universities and you'd have a very antagonistic kind of crowds. Um, you get that less so these days. People are a bit more sympathetic. But when people are very antagonistic, you get kind of one very angry atheist who would be kind of a girt you. And I always thought, well, what's the point of trying to engage this one angry atheist? Because I'm not going to necessarily change his mind right now. But then as someone said, you know, it's not just that person. It's all, all the people watching your interaction yeah. who are deciding whether they want to ultimately intellectually side with them or with you mm. and they're watching not only what you say but also the manner in which you communicate and respond and i think yeah in many ways on you know, particularly depending on your settings on facebook but if you're doing stuff very publicly um there are lots of other people potentially watching how you engage and dialogue yeah. in these ways and so it's not you know it's not just am i going to win this one person by my interaction but but how do i witness to christ to others who might be mm. watching this interaction um, and particularly on Facebook, I found less so on Twitter. We were saying um, earlier in our kind of pre-discussion, sometimes people just don't bother looking at kind of the Twitter mm-hmm. debates. But but sometimes, you know, particularly on Facebook, you kind of get discussion threads under a comment and and that can be quite helpful um, for others. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly in my experience, other people have been reading those comment threads mm-hmm. and have sometimes responded to me privately about the kind of discussions that I've had. They've not been willing to kind of publicly say anything, mm-hmm. but they're saying, oh, actually, I agree with you or whatever. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's so, so interesting. I had the same thing happen. One of my other controversies was on the gay conversion therapy ban debate, which we'll, mm-hmm. we'll, we, we may or may not do a, a sort of show on at some point in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I was just going at it with some guy back and forth, just trying to kind of respond on the kind of Christian response mm-hmm. to defending prayer. Um, and no one's responding to me or liking my stuff. A few people are coming onto his side, like similar with this other debate. Mm-hmm. But then I got an email from someone sending me like articles and, and sort of showing support in the background, which is a weird thing, isn't it? That you have, there is this sense, as you say, Michael, mm. that we're doing this as mm. much for who's watching. And that's partly what's also motivated me because I see things going on the line. I see things I don't like, or I see things I do like that have encouraged me. And I thought, if I'm encouraged by that person putting their head up a bit, I ought to be doing that for others because there's a few people who might look at what I'm doing mm. and go, oh, are you allowed to say that? I want to say that, but I don't feel I can. And that's helped me a little bit to say it. So I think there's a, a, a possibly a duty for us to do that as well as to support people. Andy, any, any kind of thoughts on that? Yeah, I was thinking thinking about that. And, and, and a couple there's a couple of things that, that, that sprang to mind, Aaron. One, of course, is I think one of the things, of course, that lies behind this that can cause Christians and others to be afraid and not speak up is, of course, the whole kind of offence archaeology business that, you know, mm. you say something on social media or you like something. I mean, to go... There was a famous case uh, you know, two or three years ago about a chap who got fired. I think it was by by Asda, which is a big supermarket chain here in uh, in the UK. And uh, he, in his case, he simply shared, I think, or, 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 or like retweeted a Billy Connolly kind mm-hmm. of video. And somebody had some got in social media gone, "Oh, that's Islamophobic," and uh, and Asda had fired him. And then, thankfully, there was such a furore that went, then went the other way that he was eventually reinstated. But I think some people get afraid of, gosh, if I share the wrong thing, even like the wrong thing, what happens if, you know, a friend, a family member, or the HR department, whatever. So we all hunker down. But then what that leads into is, I think, is then people sort of being left out and hung out to dry, which is kind yeah. of experience you describe. And I remember hearing an interview with um, with Douglas Murray. We've quoted Douglas a, a couple of times in the past on, on Pod of the Gaps. And for folks who don't know him, he's actually quite interesting character he is um he's gay he's an atheist uh but i think he i think i heard somewhere he describes himself as a christian atheist now in which he's very drawn to the christian faith Mm. he doesn't actually think it's 
just doesn't think it's true. And actually, he's, he's just on a very interesting dialogue for Premier Radio with with N.T. Wright, which yeah. is very worth listening That's to. Cool. He's, a, he's a fascinating character. I saw Douglas doing a thing on this whole kind of cancel culture business and social media where he talked about, look, there's a huge need for just ordinary, normal, decent people to stand up for one another. So if your friend gets the Twitter pile on, you know, if all the decent people run away and hide, that poor yeah. person gets mach- gets shot to pieces. Yeah. Um, he said, you know, if at work someone gets in trouble for, you know, they share a Billy Connolly video and HR get involved, everyone mm-hmm. runs and hides. So what about if the decent people, the normal people, stood up and went, no, you're not firing our colleague because mm-hmm. he shared a Billy Connolly video. Go away. Mm-hmm. And if, mm-hmm. pe- if people stuck together, it would be it would be harder for the bullies, mm-hmm. uh, I think. And as I think as Christians, it's especially important so yeah i think maybe there is a sense of that you know if you're on social media but you're not somebody who tweets much yourself but you're on there i uh, would be at so be you know instagram or facebook or twitter or youtube or whatever and you see you know a christian having a rough time of it maybe it is worth you know mm. considering it mm. could be hugely encouraging just like in your case if two or three christians have come along and gone, hey aaron that was really helpful thank you for that mm. you don't need to engage in the argument so much as mm. go you're not on your own yeah um but often we tend to Shut up. And if we shut up and, you know, walk off the playing field, as it were, then we leave that that playing field to the lunatics. And by which I stress the lunatics on our own side as well. Because mm-hmm. I've heard this from the other side too, that sometimes our, my atheist friends sort of think that all Christians are fundamentalist, you know, whatevers, because mm-hmm. those tend to be the loudest voices. And twi- and social media tends to magnify the, the loudest voices. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's cu- crucially important the more thoughtful Christians show that we're here and out there and also willing to stick up for one another. That's really good, and and you know, oh, 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 and obviously a, a, a good uh, reminder for those five hundred listeners who did leave your t- your Twitter following account to come back to the fold and make make get you back up to the hundred. There is all repentance is always a, is always is always available. Right? <laughs> That's right at a, a, a banister dot net or whatever your. I have your other followers who are not of this Twitter account or something to. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it's interesting as well. You know, we're, we're thinking about that. That it's we're, we're thinking about Christians. You know, as you say, Andy, showing solidarity with one another, uh, weighing in and showing just genuine without without it necessarily being antagonistic and being an us versus them um, fight off or whatever or the double showdown. As much as to some extent, it's unavoidable because, as you say, the Paul is in the, the agora. He's debating. He de- he knows that stuff's going to go down. He, he knows that, you know, things are going to, trouble will be caused. He doesn't want the trouble. He's not trying to cause the trouble. Everywhere he goes, I've been reading Acts with my children recently, and they're just like, oh, again, it's like the Jews stirring up trouble against uh, against uh, the apostles as they go here. And then they're stirring up the crowds. So there is a, almost a very similar, you could read Acts and, and think of Twitter as a kind of an analogous situation, the stirring up of the crowds and the rioting that kind of happens. And it's a direct result of, of, of you know light coming into darkness to some extent and so it's going to happen paul doesn't mind it he even gets told if you go to jerusalem you're going to get arrested don't go and he's like mm-hmm. i know that i'm probably going to get arrested and i'm ready to die for the gospel mm-hmm. now so of course we're not you know we can dramatize our sort of martyr complexes in the west a lot which is very inappropriate sometimes but we do have to sense in what sense should we be dying to ourselves um, and, and thinking sacrificially about yeah. our reputations, um, you know, on, in, in these sort of spheres, as long as they're not the, the kind of wrong kind of fight, as it were, the, the, the waste of time. I, mean, I was wondering, Michael, do you have anything to add on this? You know, the, the sense of what are the debates that are worth fighting or jumping in on? And what are the ones that are worth staying out of? Because, of course, in the, in the New Testament, there's also the injunctions to avoid quarrels to avoid controversies like genealogies about the law um, as Paul mm. refers to specifically mm. there's certain debates which are going to waste your time and that's a big thing Paul again says in Colossians walk in wisdom toward the outsiders make your best make the best use of the time let your spe- speech always be gracious seasoned with salt so how do we do that mm. and how do we choose the right fight yeah I think um, one of the things that I've tried to kind of ask myself before I get involved in discussions is am I going to add anything different here because I'm speaking as a Christian Hmm. or am I just joining in and picking a side you know if you know it's so often you know I've I've read people's kind of engagements on social media and they could basically be regurgitating either the spectator or the guardian depending on which side of the political divide they come down on and if all I'm doing is repeating arguments that I've read in one of those two or more publications I'm not really helping anything. Like, I'm just, you know, what am I adding to it? So I guess one of my questions is, can I say something specifically Christian here? 
um, and engage in this. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm necessarily jumping straight in at the heart of the gospel, you know, speaking of the cross of Christ, although ultimately that's as an evangelist where I'd always want to take people. Um, but it may be, you know, often I find it's actually engaging in issues of, of sin. You know, what is human nature? You know, what what is... Um, what does it mean to be human and that kind of stuff. And so a lot of the kind of debates around um, on social media kind of touch on these kind of big kind of theological issues, uh, but thinking, how can I speak into this kind of Christianly? And I think that's one of the um, questions. And if I haven't got anything kind of different to say, then maybe just keep out and let other people do the debating. There's plenty of other people who will have, you know, say kind of stuff either way. Um, So I find that kind of helpful. I, I can't say I've always kind of kept my own principles but i try to keep that as a yeah. as a principle at least yeah yeah that's a good point and it's interesting because there's sometimes you know they call them sort of gatekeeping issues aren't there mm-hmm. where it's not a big issue in and of itself but it's something that will open a floodgate mm-hmm. to other issues and mm-hmm. so that's why that's where the people on the more let's say more conservative side who want to weigh in on some of these debates mm-hmm. more frequently than mm. than met the many the kind of majority I'd say the majority of evangelicals probably sit on the fence and, and middling around a lot, which is mm. odd. Mm. Evangelicals didn't used to have that reputation. We probably had an overly acerbic mm. reputation on the right for calling out the sins of others. Mm. Now we sort of I think we rejoice in the fact that we are not like those terrible quarrelers uh, on the far right. <laughs> we are not like those crazy people. We are the nice, mm. um, you know. The, mm. the kind of placid ones in the middle who don't cause trouble mm. that's i think more of a more of a danger perhaps now um but, yeah. but i don't know it's 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 difficult because you you don't, you don't want to waste time you also don't want to leave the fights that need to be fought because they actually will, will they'll come back to haunt us you know the wolves will come back for us if we keep giving away more and more ground on, on things and it won't yeah. just be things in the public sphere it will be things that affect the church directly um such as the by the way the gay conversion therapy ban more on that another time Andy, anything to jump in on that with? Yeah, I, as, oh gosh, there's so many things I, 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 I could say. I, I think, I think, I think a couple of things, um, you know, occur to me. I think your your point there about the way that evangelicals have shifted is interesting. I think some of that, as you say, that shift has been good, and I think it's been helpful that we're not out there, you know, fighting it, fighting the culture wars constantly and yeah. making trouble everywhere. But then I think the problem is now it's not so much that we've done this in a reason way. Now I think it's outright cowardice. It's a sense of, you know, not being attacked. If I don't stick my head above the parapet and let them come for others, you know, it's like the old joke about the, you know, the two folks, you know, the two the two friends hiking in, in the woods in North America and suddenly a grizzly bear leaps out onto the track and, you know, one of them drops to his knees, pulls a pair of running shoes out of his backpack and starts changing out of his hiking boots into his running shoes. And his friend says, are you insane? I mean, that, that bear can run 30 miles an hour. You can't outrun a grizzly bear. To which yeah. he says, no, mate, I've only got to outrun you. <laughs> and uh, and I think there could be a little bit of that on social media yeah. and at the public square generally of going, oh gosh, I'm so glad, I'm so glad they're going, they're going for those, you know, those conversion conversion therapy nuts. Or I'm so glad they're going for, you know, the American, you know, evangelicals who think that Trump is everything because they're not going yeah. for me. Yeah. And as you say, the danger is once the wolves have picked off the the easy low hanging fruit. Well, mm. I'm not sure wolves do pick off low hanging fruit. The metaphor breaks down. <laughs> but anyway, um, once they picked off the low hanging kebabs. Then they're, they're going to come for us. And you know what's interesting is I think about that and, and all of this. You know, the, there is a there is a parable of Jesus that I think is is, is sort of strangely relevant, hmm. which is the you know the Good Samaritan, right? Because you know you could retell that in the sense of you know there's some poor pastor somewhere who's accidentally perhaps phrased something unhelpfully. The hmm. you know he's got beaten up by bandits there on the hmm. social media kind of platforms mm. and he's wounded and along come you know a, a succession of christians go oh gosh i'm glad it's not me and we pass by mm. on the other side and uh, maybe there's something about being the good samaritan actually and going okay i'm going to risk things because the bandits might still be behind the rocks mm. and actually i'm going to step in uh mm. to, to, to the gap here but there is also at the same time the wisdom in knowing which hill to fight on. And I mentioned N.T. Wright earlier, you know, Tom Wright, yeah. who's, who did that debate on, well, more of a discussion, actually, on Premier the other day with um, with Doug Murray. And Tom said something once, and he said, you know, evangelicals have this t- horrible tendency of picking the wrong hills to die on. Yeah. Um, and then they just die on those hills. I mean, perhaps a good example of that at the risk of, you know, perhaps causing a few listeners to go, oh, gosh, really, is it, do, you know, are, you, are you serious? But I take the gay marriage one. 
I think we were always going to lose that that one in the, in the wider culture. I think there are more important battles around sexuality, especially around what marriage means inside the church. Yeah. But you know, we invested such energy in the way we fought that in some parts of the culture on both sides of the Atlantic with almost mm-hmm. a kind of scorched earth policy. Yeah. Um, but then we lost it, which I think we were going to in this culture. Yeah. And the result is I think we we damaged some things and made it harder to speak into other things and lost track of the more important battle, which I think we're now seeing through the gay conversion thing, which is what does sexuality mean within the church? And if we're not careful, we've missed the fact there are there are wolves within the sheepfold. Um, you know, they're not so much wolves in sheep's clothing as wolves in shepherd's clothing, as you know, yeah. Glenn Scriven, who we've quoted before, has yeah. said. And I think we fought we picked the wrong battle frankly or we yeah. fought that battle in an helpful way yeah that's fascinating I love, I love that use of the good samaritan mm-hmm. that's really interesting kind of you know you know applying that to the kind of twitter mobs <laughs> being beaten up by twitter bandits or whatever it's a yeah, interesting i think we're saying on that it's interesting as well kind of like there are certain kind of like acceptable kind of discussions to have and certain kind of ones that people are like we oh, shouldn't have that so you know for instance if a christian engages with like richard dawkins or an atheist like no one's gonna be like oh you shouldn't do that it's like well yeah. Like, yeah, it's obvious that you would stand up for the truth and engagement in that kind of way. Probably, you know, again, you know, Andy's done a lot of stuff, you know, engaging with Muslims. And again, people would be like, well, that's great. You know, you're standing up for the truth of the gospel in, in the light of kind of that belief system. But then when the belief system is not atheism or Islam, but maybe a kind of progressive, very yeah. far left kind of yeah. worldview, a uh, kind of neo-Marxist worldview, we might say, although labels are difficult. Mm. The moment you start engaging with that stuff, people say, oh, you can't do that. You know, yeah. like, that, you know, mm. and I just find that really interesting as if like, you know, if it's not like, as surely as Christians, we accept that everybody has a worldview, a belief system. Mm. And just because they haven't labeled themselves out and out atheist doesn't mean that that belief system is therefore Christian. Yeah. Um, and and therefore, you know, I think we do need to engage in you know every argument that sets yeah. itself up against Christ. You know, it doesn't yeah. matter whether it's Richard Dawkins. Yeah. You know, in a sense, that's not the big debate on Twitter today. Yeah. Yeah. No, and here's a controversial kind of thought for you for you too. Of course, I mean, so again, to think about how one might exegete the Good Samaritan in that context. Dawkins, of course, got himself in trouble recently yes. because he said some things that are actually perfectly sane about 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 gender and, and sex. You know, he's a, he's a biologist. You know, we are you know a sexually dimorphic spe- morphic species or something to that effect. And he got, got of course all the woke progressives leapt on him. I remember looking at it and thinking, no, I confess I didn't, so I'm not putting myself forward and going, hey, I'm glad I did this. But I do wonder, actually, it would have been quite interesting for if, if a few Christians had come alongside and stood up for him, because that would have been the Good Samaritan, right? Of going, He's mm-hmm. actually our enemy, in some ways, the truth of the gospel. But maybe if Christians kept a lookout for people who, again, getting you know vicious stuff online and, and, and come alongside and go, well, you know, how dare you treat people that way? Mm. Um, who knows mm. how the Lord might use that? It'd be interesting if Dawkins' takeaway from that had been, man, those Christians were sticking up for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Even though I spent the last 20 years putting the boot in. Yeah, that's why I, mean, I, I did actually tweet about that at the time, but neither of you liked it. So you didn't want to come oh. to my aid. So, you know, I okay, won't do that. I think, I think that's high, that's an issue as well, though, that we, you know, it's so often in, you could, I've noticed this this week actually with, um, you know, the, horrific stuff happening in kind of Israel and Gaza and everything going on. I thought, isn't it interesting? You can basically know exactly what someone's going to think about, a, you know, a conflict in the Middle East, hmm. given what they've already said about Brexit or, yeah. or they've said about something. I'm like, why? Like, why, why completely unrelated situations? But you can hmm. kind of like, we know that person will be for this, for that, for that. Hmm. And I just think as Christians, we should just be a bit more like, we should be on the side of truth, basically. Yeah. And so, you know, rather than saying, like, I fit into this camp and I agree with everyone who's in my camp and I disagree with all of you, like, yeah. there's a time for Christians to say, yeah, I agree with Dawkins. And other times to say, I completely, utterly disagree with Dawkins. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. James Lindsay's another guy on, on Twitter. He's a very fascinating guy. He's an atheist, but actually he's quite, you know, um, outspokenly taken on kind of the progressive far left um, in many ways. And, you know, in, in some ways as a Christian, I completely disagree with him. But as other times, I think actually I wouldn't want to stand up. I think he's standing up for the truth, you know, on this particular issue or whatever. So I think we need to be on the side of truth, uh, more yeah. importantly than on the side of a particular camp. Yeah. yeah. There's another issue here too, isn't there? I'm conscious we you know where uh, our time is shortly coming to a close because Aaron has to go off and, and play some manly sport or something, uh, <laughs> netball or something, I believe. But um, sort of going... The other question I think for us in this, or for me in this, is also, of course, what's the ultimate goal, right? Is the goal drawing attention to myself? Is the goal, you know, making myself feel good that I fought that fight or I, or I backed that person to a corner? And I do wonder if it comes back to 
mm-hmm. you know, to what extent, you know, what is that? When someone looks at our social media feed, where does it point? Does it does it point to to Christ or elsewhere? I think I was saying before the show began, I are there, are you at risk of it? I won't mention names because it can sound dreadfully judgmental. Um, but, you know, it's been interesting over the years watching various sort of high profile Christians across both the left and the right of the church. And I'll, one way I'll often assess somebody as a Christian in the public square, I confess, is look at their social media and go, is it just about them? Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Now, all of us can do that on social media. It's not very difficult. But is it also, is there also a fair amount in there of look at Jesus, look at Jesus, look at Jesus? And one of my, one of my big, you know, one of the folks I admire a lot on social media in that regard is say something, something like Tim Keller, um, you know, multiple best-selling author he could easily talk about himself all the time but i love tim's twitter feed because it's just so gospel sent and jesus sent and there's something like that whole humility piece and while um, michael was talking i was looking up the reference there's a there's a wonderful one of the best books on on humility was written by a guy called andrew murray uh, we like to go back in time often to the puritans this is not as far as the puritans and he didn't write a puritan book uh, title which was a paragraph long he just yeah. wrote a book i think called on humility in 1895 hmm. and it's just brilliant some of the insights in there and i love his his, his definition of, of humility, which could have been written for Twitter because it fits into 140 yeah. characters. Where he said, humility is nothing but the disappearance of self in the vision that God is all. Um, and there's something about that on social media, isn't there? I think of going, how do I make sure that it's not the other way around, <laughs> that not the yeah. things that really matter are disappearing in the me, 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 me? Because that's what yeah. social media wants us to become. And yeah. I think as Christians, we need to, that's the bit we do need to resist. Mm. That's a really good point. I think, I think it's, you know, the, the, but Twitter could do with a lot of humility, couldn't it? Or we all we all could. It's funny, isn't it, to have that. Um, I I want to add a footnote to it, which would which would sort of be again back to the confidence thing. Do we often see humility as a coward's way out? I don't mean mm-hmm. that humility is equatable. I mean how we use the rhetoric of humility. I won't get involved in this because that yeah. would be me putting myself forward. Paul could have said, I don't want to go into the cause trouble in the Agora. That will make that will be detrimental to the gospel. I think Michael made the excellent point uh, maybe last year or the show before. Paul was there's the opposite. He said, this is good for the gospel that I'm in prison. That kind of thing. Draw, but people could easily say, you're drawing mm. attention to yourself. You're causing trouble. You want to make a name for yourself. And actually, we need to, the humility is also dying to yourself and going, I don't care what happens yeah. to me, really. Michael, yeah. jump in. No, I, I think I just wanted to kind of affirm what you were saying there. I think that sense of humility of dying to yourself and saying, like, I don't care what people think. Because actually it does hurt. You know, when mm. you get involved in, mm-hmm. this is one of the reasons why, you know, sometimes I don't get involved. Because I know if I say this or stand up for that person, I know I'm going to get backlash. I know when I open my Facebook or my Twitter, I'm going to have like, you know, so many notifications. And it's it's not nice reading through stuff where people mm. are basically saying, like horrible stuff about you yeah and people can say some really horrible stuff and mm. and actually it's not humility to avoid that it's the opposite you know if, yeah. if i'm too worried about what people think about me i won't get involved in a sense yeah. because yeah. i won't want people to speak negatively of me and one of the things you know during last year when i was getting quite a lot of negative feedback um on one particular post i spoke to another christian friend and i said you know how do you handle this and and they said you know it's really helpful to be able to engage mm. close down your facebook twitter and then just leave it with God and yeah. actually to go to bed and know the Lord of the universe loves, approves and is pleased with me. Mm. And it really doesn't matter mm. what anyone else thinks. Mm. And actually to preach the gospel to oneself. So I found engaging in social media is a great way to like, not only, you know, to question, you know, our pride or our humility, but also to say, I need the gospel if I'm going to do this. I need to know that God approves of me and loves me yeah. because if i'm going into social media seeking people's approval i'm going to be the worst person engaging in that environment yeah because i'm not going to stand up for the truth i'm going to side with whoever seems most popular yeah. or i'm just going to keep out of it altogether but if i've right. got the assurance of, of god that frees me in a sense to start to challenge and to speak the truth that's great yeah and interesting uh, uh, you know thinking of the uh, the great, great kind of way for us to kind of bring this to a close really it's interesting my, this lack of self-watch the, you're watching yourself and your own mm-hmm. reputation too closely it reminds me of a kind of proverbial mm-hmm. saying from G.K. Chesterton. He said, "It's uh, it's the um, the humble man who talks much, for the proud man watches mm-hmm. himself too closely." Um, <laughs> and I think that's something that we could we could take into thinking about online presence as well. As much as some might abuse that and take it the other way, I think it's something that people can reflect on. So if you are out there thinking, "Oh, I don't know if I should get on." Let us encourage you uh, to get out there, get into the Agora, speak truth, 
and get into some debates that might be helpful. Pray about it, as Michael's saying, and as Andy's saying, don't waste time, don't get into things that are going to be unhelpful, but actually um, you know, know who you are in Christ. And then because of who you are in Christ, f- be free, go and live free and see what happens. And the worst, you know, there are worse things that can happen than, you know, the, what's the worst that can happen really, in, in a sense. There's things that you can, the fears can be bigger in your head than are the case in reality. So um, yeah, well, thank you guys. It was a wonderful uh, kicking around of that idea uh, back and forth. And I hope it's been helpful for you listeners. Um, so from myself, Aaron Edwards, Andy Bannister and Michael Otts, it's goodbye for now. And uh, we'll hear each other, see each other next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.